All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Ellingstead. I'm part of the Grow Remote uh, organization. Uh, we're here today with Ruth Morrissey from the Department of Business, Enterprise, and Innovation. This is part of our series on policy needs around remote working. Uh, if you've not been to a previous session, uh, welcome to the first. You might have heard last week as well, the, uh, the Department of Business, uh, Enterprise, and Innovation also launched a public consultation on remote working. Uh, what's really exciting though is that beyond the public consultation and our opportunity uh, to provide input to that, the department has been doing extensive research and has extensive insights uh, to share as well. So I'm delighted uh, to, to welcome Ruth this afternoon and I'm going to turn over to her and we'll get started. After Ruth's uh, presentation and background, uh, we'll, we'll go into a Q&A and I'll come back on right after that. So Ruth, over to you. That's great. Thanks a million, Paul. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and we really appreciate the opportunity to be able to, to promote the work that the department is doing um, as well as get some feedback on it. So I have prepared a few slides for today, which I'm going to share with you now. Sorry, just a bit of a, a delay on my laptop. Um, so yeah, so as Paul has said, um, my name is Ruth Marcy and I work in the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation. Um, this is the government department that now is being headed up by Antonista Leo Varadkar and formerly was um, headed by Minister Heather Humphreys. Um, so basically we, we're kind of in charge of all of the enterprise and business related aspects of the economy and we will be changing our name in the future to the Department of Enterprise Trade and Employment um, and we'll be doing that formally but not as of yet. So um, as I said I work in the department, I work in the Labour Market and Skills Unit there. Um, myself and my colleague Katie Griffin have been working on the remote work policy um, area for about 18 months now. Um, and it's been kind of a, a journey from then obviously to where we are now and I'd like to fill you in on that and I'd also like to let you know what kind of the next steps are going to be ongoing. So um, where it all began I suppose is the Remote Work in Ireland report. This was published in December 2019. Um, this was really um, I suppose the beginning of it all um, in, in recent years for our department. Um, we were coming into a landscape where not a huge amount was known on remote working in Ireland. Obviously, there are a lot of companies that engage with it and anecdotally, we had lots of people that we know who were working remotely. Um, but there wasn't that much national data available or that much research based solely on Ireland that we could rely upon to make informed policy. So the Remote Work in Ireland report was the first step towards achieving some of that. To give you an idea of just the background to it, well, it was part of the Future Jobs um, initiative, which was launched uh, last year also, and is the whole of government plan that is looking at how we can be economically successful in changing environments. There was four main pillars to this, and one of them was focused on increasing participation in the labour force. Um, and there were a number of different ambitions and uh, deliverables that were sitting under that, and this report fell underneath one of them. So specifically, the ambition was to foster participation in the labour force through flexible working solutions. And we were tasked with undertaking research on the prevalence and types of remote working arrangements, the attitudes towards such arrangements and the factors that inhibit employers and employees from partaking in them. We also actually expanded that definition a little bit because we thought that looking at just the inhibiting factors was too limiting. So we expanded it to influencing factors so we could understand what encouraged as well as inhibited the uptake of remote working. Um, I'll give you a sense now of our project scope and I won't bore you too much with this, but basically what we were trying to figure out was to categorize the different types of remote work available, to quantify the prevalence of remote work, to assess the attitudes from multiple stakeholder groups and we did this through a lot of engagement um, with different bodies like employer representatives, the enterprise agencies um, and also with Grow Remote. We were looking as I said at identifying the influencing factors 
and we undertook a high level policy uh, review of countries internationally to see what they had done in the space. Um, and then finally, we sought to bring it all together by identifying relevant policy implications. So to do this, uh, we had the following methodology. We formed an interdepartmental steering group. Um, I suppose what became quite clear from the beginning was that there was a lot of different work that was going on in different departments and across the civil service and agencies that was related to remote work, but maybe had different specific end goals. So we would have included our own department, the department of, sorry, our own department, which is the Department of Business, um, and also the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection, the Department of Rural and Community Development, Justice and Equality, the Climate Action, um, Communications, Climate Action and the Environment, and as well as the Department of Antishock, because there was a lot of different departments, as I said, that would have relevance to the work. Then we carried out um, desk research. We took uh, key stakeholder engagements on board. We carried out a remote working consultation forum. And that's what the picture is there of uh, Minister Humphreys and Minister Bruton, um, along with Leanne Cunnell, who is the manager of the Cavan Digital Hub. Uh, and that was an opportunity for us to get employers, employees and policymakers in the same room and then get them to help us tease out some of the questions that we had. In October, we would have carried out our national employee survey on remote work to get some more, um, I suppose, a better idea of exactly what the influencing factors were for employees. And then finally, we brought this all together in our final report, which I said um, previously was published in December 2019. So it became quite clear from the beginning of the work um, that there was a lot of different terms that people use when they're talking about remote work. They don't necessarily mean the same things, but often they can be used interchangeably. So we wanted to make sure that we were being very clear on what we were looking at. Um, and what you can see there is we were focused on hub work and on homework. Um, and as I'm sure all of you will well know by now, um, home working is very straightforward in the definition. It includes employees that are working from home and hub working, which is looking at employees working from a hub close to or within their local community. And we also include co-working within this definition. The next step was to look at the current and ongoing work that was taking place um, within the different departments. Uh, we knew there was quite a lot going on and as I mentioned already, we soon realised that while there was a lot going on, it was carried out in different streams with different but linked end goals. Uh, and I suppose before I go into this, it's important just to, to mention that all of this work was ongoing um, before COVID-19 and um, even now there'll be, there'll be more work going on in these areas and I'll come to that in a moment. But this is just to, to let you know what the original report was based on. So we had regional growth. Uh, my own department's regional enterprise plans were looking at actions which included developing regional hubs and hot desking facilities across the country. The Western Development Commission obviously have done a lot of work on the Atlantic Economic Corridor for enterprise and remote working hubs. Uh, the Department of Rural and Community Development um, had been given a billion euro in funding uh, from the government that can be spent from 2019 to I think 2027 um, and they were doing this to, to promote remote working in and I suppose in general job generation um, in, in rural communities in Ireland and they did this in collaboration with the Western Development Commission as well. Enterprise Development, Enterprise Ireland have a regional strategy called Powering the Regions and within that they have their Work Smart Challenge which is looking at supporting 10,000 co-working and incubation spaces in regional locations across the country. We had regulations and guidance. So this was work that was being carried out actually by the Small Firms Association, but was a really, really helpful resource. So what they had done was they had put together guidelines um, or should I say maybe kind of a guidance checklist for employers who were considering remote working where you could go onto their website and have a look at this checklist to make sure that you had considered all the considerations that come with an employer offering home working uh, or remote working and indeed what you know their duties are to employees and this would have been drawing on you know existing legislation um, and regulations that had already been set out by the health and safety authority amongst others. Um, 
training and development. Again, we're in, a, we're in a very different space than last year. There is a lot of training and development available now, including, I know, um, Grow Remote in collaboration with Sullis and IDA and the Leash Offaly ETB. Um, at the time, even then, there was a good bit of um, training available and it was growing all the time. And some of the ones that we had mentioned in the report was um, a TU Dublin module on the future of work and the Irish Institute of Training and Development were working on a program for managing and working in remote teams. And then finally, um, we looked at the people who were promoting remote work and obviously we engaged with uh, Grow Remote on this to understand exactly what was going on in um, that community. So our next step then was to look at the prevalence of remote work. And again, I mean, I, I feel like you could nearly be saying this all the time with any presentation that you do now, but a lot has changed this year. Um, there has been, you know, a lot more data that's coming through. Um, I know that the Western Development Commission and NUIG did a really good survey in the area um, on working remotely during COVID-19. Uh, Eurofound as well have done lots of work on living and working and you're able to compare Ireland's results to other countries in the European Union and, and that's just to name two I mean there, there's plentiful data now at the moment um, this was definitely not the case for us last year um, so we had to work with the data that we could get our hands on and use that as an indicator perhaps of the broader trends so in 2016 um, obviously the census was carried out and that was our first port of call um, that showed that about 57,000 people were working from home, which was an increase on 2011. However, we were quite aware of the, the you know, the limitations of this data, um, given that, you know, in 2019, this was already three years old. And obviously, as technology uh, improves, you know, the pace of change is very, very fast. So we were certain that there was probably more people than this working from home. Um, we looked also at a 2021 census pilot that the CSO had been running um, and it showed that amongst those at work, 18% um, of people were working from home and that was from a sample size of about 15,000 different houses. Uh, the most popular option was being one day a week, but there was also people engaging in it twice a week and five days a week. And then finally, we looked at some of the research that Indeed had carried out um, and you can see there that they had seen that there was an increase of 171% of people who were searching the terms remote working over the year 2016 to 2017. So this was the kind of data that was in place at the time. Um, again, as I said, not necessarily very strong data, but it, very useful to us nonetheless to try and understand whereabouts we are where. To, to add um, to some of the, the work that was being carried out, um, sorry, I think I skipped a slide there. Yes, yeah, so um, we did a remote work in Ireland employee survey, and I mentioned that earlier, it was held in October last year. Um, we got over three and a half thousand respondents. Um, they were about 60% private sector, 40% public. The majority were from Dublin, they were aged between 35 and 54, they were in the occupational categories of manager, director and senior official uh, and also in the professional occupations. Um, there was a huge response I suppose across um, different sectors but particularly for the financial services sector and also for the IT sector which definitely has a bearing on some of the results you're about to see. Um, we know that it's not fully representative of the economy, but again, it was helping us to provide those indicators of what was influencing employees. So we asked the question firstly, do you work remotely? And you can see there, it was almost 50-50 between those that did and those that didn't. So then we also asked those that did not, would they like to? And you can see there, immediately it became clear there was huge employee demand that people would like to be working remotely. So that was interesting for us from the outset to make sure that we were on the, the right track in investigating this. We then looked to the motivating factors for remote workers. So for those people who were working remotely, we asked them why. And obviously here, the results were really em emphatic. It was about reduced commute and greater flexibility. Um, and this was really, really interesting for us to see because it was so firstly overwhelming, but also very much true across all the different cohorts. So all of our answers would have been checked by, by sector, by gender, by age, um, by each different 
you know, kind of cohort, we saw the same thing. Um, very slight changes on the figures, but definitely reduced commute and greater flexibility were the strongest motivating factors. Uh, one of the surprises on this for us was the low result of childcare costs and accessibility reasons um, in around 2 and 2.5% there. And the reason for that was because that had come through a lot kind of anecdotally and in some research. Um, but when it came to it, it wasn't really coming through in our survey at all. We asked the same question to the people who weren't working remotely, again, very much on the same page. Um, with the same responses for reduced commute and greater flexibility. The interesting thing about this was that environmental reasons was given a much higher percentage by the people who wanted to work remotely but weren't. It was 1.5% for remote workers, but 6.1% for non-remote workers, um, which maybe suggests just growing trends towards people being aware of sustainability and of their own carbon footprint. Also, you can see childcare costs here has risen from um, I think it was around 2.5% to 4.5%, um, which maybe is something around people trying to understand how they could remote work and how they might be able to, to mitigate against some of the costs that they are incurring. Um, I don't know if there might be a different result to that now. Um, if we did it again, depending on how many people who've been trying to remote work with the child at home, I may think they might have changed their mind. Um, so basically, if we look at the overall influencing factors for employees, well, as I said, flexibility was clear coming in across each of those cohorts. Um, Work-life balance, obviously a really big benefit, um, but the number one piece of feedback in terms of a challenge we got on remote working was the ability to, to switch off and kind of overworking. And I think in our survey, there's about 47% of people who said that that was their biggest challenge as a remote worker. Uh, we also had cost effectiveness, of course, um, remote working has the ability to lessen accommodation pressures as people don't need to live in the most expensive areas of the country to live in and also uh, can reduce how much they travel. The reduced commute, of course, with lots of different benefits that were far reaching but could range anything from environmental to personal reasons. Health impacts came through strongly, um, kind of in, in two different ways. So. Firstly, um, a lot of people who were working for, from home would, sorry, had higher morale and lower stress. However, this was also kind of important to note that people also felt isolated, um, maybe more anxious and lonely, and that they were the risks of remote working, which maybe we're probably even more um, aware of now following, you know, working from home during a time of lockdown. And then cultural factors. People wanted to have trust, communication and outreach between themselves and their managers and the organisations that they were working in. They wanted to be working in areas that, you know, was really showing that there was a good mindset and culture which was enabling change. So then the influencing factors for employers. Well, motivational effects, we can see kind of as, as I said earlier, you know, if employees are experiencing more morale, um, it means that employers too are, are noticing the difference of this motivational effect amongst their staff. Accessing and retaining talent. When we carried out the report last year, we were in a very tight labour market. We were almost at full, um, uh, full employment. Uh, so it was seen as a benefit to help attract and retain highly skilled workers. Increased productivity. Um, employees were given, I suppose, opportunity to work in areas where they might be able to concentrate better um, and this had benefits for the employers. Cost effectiveness uh, came through as a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, I suppose the idea was that businesses had the opportunity to reduce overhead costs by perhaps having smaller offices. However, having people work remotely also requires investment in infrastructures and in cybersecurity. Sustainability was seen as a big pull for employers who wanted to be delivering more on their green goals and decrease harmful emissions and energy use. And then finally, and one of the, the largest influencing factors was a lot of employers said to us that they had difficulties in introducing a formal uh, remote working policy because they were unsure as to exactly what should be included, how they would manage equality aspects of offering it, um, 
I suppose, what they could do to manage it and also to ensure people weren't overworking and also uh, very importantly to make sure that employees health and safety was not at risk. So ultimately, um, sorry, I don't know if that slide has moved on. Um, so we had our key policy implications. So ultimately it came down to three areas, guidance, data and collaboration. So really what came through strongly was that there was a lack of official guidelines for employers and employees on areas such as equality, health and safety, employment conditions and data protection and training. There also was a lack of data um, on engagement on remote working with employers and employees and also on the national hub infrastructure. So definitely now there's far more data available on employers and employees, but there probably still is some more information that we need in terms of understanding that national hub infrastructure. And then finally, collaboration. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot going on, but perhaps maybe not um, anything going on that included everyone who was working in the area. Um, so some collaboration was taking place, but we thought that if we increased that, we could have a more cohesive government approach. So that's kind of the whistle stop tour of everything um, that we did in that report. And now we've very much moved on to our next steps. So following that report, our minister at the time, Minister Humphreys, um, committed to forming an interdepartmental group to align all of the approaches and to bring some more of this collaboration forward. So that's very much what we've done now. Um, earlier in the year, this group was formed um, and they have been tasked, I suppose, with steering the delivery of guidance on remote working that will be complete by the end of this year. At the first meeting of this group, um, we decided that the priority really would be to get together all of the information from the state that's currently available um, on remote working and put it into one place because before that it would have been spread across a different number of departments websites and it would have been quite difficult to um, for anyone to navigate it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to share with you um, my screen in terms of um, sorry to show you that new website. So that's it there um, and it's available and I think Laura is going to be sharing the URL with you there if you want to look at it yourself. Um, but really this is bringing together all of the information that we have on remote working. Um, you can see here it's, it's loosely um, based around the topics that came through in our report, so safety, health and welfare. Um, uh, there's loads of work that the HSA have been doing since COVID um, came in and the, all of that is linked here um, in terms of the frequently asked questions that they've been answering, um, how to position yourself well at home, what to do if you're in a sensitive risk group. They've included information on bullying, they've done a podcast on work-related stress um, given the situation. We have full details on employment conditions, looking at the Organisation of Working Time Act, um, the explanatory booklet that's in place there for employers and employees, what your um, tax reliefs you're entitled to through revenue. We have information there from the Data Protection Commission on uh, protecting personal data, remote access to networks. The National Cybersecurity Centre has released um, guidance on working from home. We have the full um, listing of all the different equality acts that you, employers need to make sure that they're staying in line with. And then we have all of the current state training that's available, um, including some of the, the work there that Grow Remote are doing with the Solis and the IDA. Um, and then finally, just any additional supports. So we're hoping that, that it will make things a little bit easier for employers and employees. Um, and it, it's a good first step, but we know that there is more to do. And that's why we've launched this consultation um, on remote working. So this was launched last week. Um, and really what we want to know, I suppose, um, specifically is, you know, what people's feedback is on that website that we've developed. Um, you know, is that guidance that's up there, is it useful? Um, is it going to, you know, is it enough? And is there anything missing? Um, and that's really what I suppose is of interest to us um, and any other further comments that you think would be important to be shared with us. The full details are here um, in this link about how to contact us. Um, and we really welcome any feedback that you might have where consultation is gonna be open until 
the 7th of August. Um, so if anyone has anything that they want to send in to us by then, I'd really appreciate it. Um, I'm also very open today to hearing any feedback that there is about what we could do. Um, and that will be really, really interesting to hear. Um, so happy to answer any questions now or indeed hear any of that feedback. Um, thanks very much. Brilliant, uh, Ruth, thanks so much. I think, um, I think for many of us, you know, it comes as, as an eye opener in a very positive way, just how much research the government has already done, not to mention how many other groups have also done additional research, but then also just the, you know, the, the methodology, you know, the, the robustness with which this has been done. It's not just a, you know, a simple survey monkey out to whoever wants to, you know, to reply, you know, it's really comprehensive uh, research, which I think really helps build confidence that there's a, you know, a robust policy. There's, there's really good understanding about something that really isn't that basic of an issue. It's, you know, there's a lot of complexity in this as well. I'm just curious, we're going to get into the questions now. They're just starting to funnel in uh, in, the, in the chat box, so I'll, I'll manage those for you. But um, I'm, I'm just curious if you can talk for maybe just a minute about the trajectory that, uh, that the department was on pre-COVID. We then had everyone thrown into this crisis management, working from home, schooling from home. How has that informed the public consultation and just the different thinking, even if it's just down to the time frame that you're accelerating your efforts, how has the pandemic actually affected how the department is thinking about uh, remote working so far? Yeah, so that's a good question. So obviously this was something that the department realized was a really important issue and that's why we started on it last year. Um, but definitely, you know, we're in a different landscape now than we were last year. Um, and I think more importantly is that we've also had a change of government. So um, in the program for government that has agreed upon by the three parties, there is a lot of um, remote working mentioned. So that's definitely going to be a big feature of what our department is doing in the future. Um, I mean, the program for government has called for the development of a remote working strategy. It's called for the development of some new policies. It's looking at bringing public sector workers uh, remote working to 20% of their time and also by, by next year and also to include, um, you know, to incentivize the, the private sector to do the same thing. Um, there's questions in there about maybe exploring the feasibility of tax arrangements and what more could be done there in order to promote remote working. Um, and also, you know, how we can enable remote but also flexible working um, more to support people's choices when it does come to parenting or childcare. So, I mean, definitely now there's, there's a massive focus on it um, that's been, I suppose, was, was always there, but, you know, COVID has really amplified that. And the fact that we have a new government means that going forward, it's definitely going to, you know, be a key focus for them. Brilliant. I'm just going to pick up on a few of the questions. Now, you, you touched on childcare, you touched on tax, which have actually been consistent themes through, you know, all of the sessions that we've held so far. L let me go uh, specifically to a question on how working meets many of the benefits of remote working. However, who pays and what are the views on that question regarding tax relief? And I think some of the, the deeper behind that is, you know, when you get into these issues of, uh, you know, where someone is, you know, working from a hub instead of even from home, uh, is, is the liability and is the, is the tax an issue for the employer, for the employee, for both, or is that something to be fleshed out yet? I think uh, at the moment what we're going on is the, the revenue guidance, which is outlined on that COVID-19 um, advice for working remotely webpage. Um, and that's where it comes into that three euro 20 a day allowance. Um, that's what's there at the moment. And there is guidance in terms of how you can apply for that um, and how you can manage that as an employer and both as an employee. Um, but it is, I think that something that now, as I said, is in the program for government. So that's what's there at the moment. That's probably likely to be examined to see if that's the most, you know, practical and maybe the best way going forward. Um, and I mean, that's something that'll be worked on shortly. So for the moment, we have that advice from revenue, um, but in the future, that could potentially change. I think going right along with that, there's a question here too on whether more regulations around how equipment is supplied to employees by companies and ensuring uh, as, you know, certain standards are met. I assume too that uh, this is all part of that consultation and 
evolution of the process from where we are today, you know, with current regulations. Very much so. I think, you know, there is the, the regulation at the moment that the employer is, is liable for employees when they're working from home. But that's exactly what we're trying to understand better in the consultation, like from employers and I suppose from the perspective of employees as well. You know, is that working well or is there something there that needs to be changed? And if so, exactly what do we need to be considering um, when we're looking at maybe investigating it further? I have the next one I want to go to here, and it, it kind of, it's both a compliment and then also I'd, I'd say it's sort of the frustration that I think a lot of people are experiencing. Uh, so there's a comment here that uh, it's a wonderful document, uh, you know, that you've shared. Is there any simple step-by-step -step training manual available for small businesses? And I think we've seen this as well, that uh, one, there's a lack of data and information, or two, there's information out there it's not uh, assembled i think you know you're showing that you guys have done a fantastic job aggregating information the next step in terms of guiding people through you know what are your thoughts or, or recommendations on how people can go from sort of the diy consumption and, and researching you know to trying to guide through all of the the wonderful material that's there Yes, yeah, so it's a good question. I think that, I mean, that is that is the kind of feedback that we want to get so we know um, what we should be doing to, to help influence, I suppose, the, the outcomes of our consultation. Um, I flagged there something that was in our remote working in Ireland report, um, and that was the Small Firms Association checklist. And I think that's actually a really, really helpful resource. And the link to that is available in through our remote work in Ireland report. So, or even just from the SFA website, you'll be able to see it. But that really outlines every single consideration that there is for employers when it comes to this. So um, I would direct to that if it was someone who was looking at it currently. Um, and hopefully then with this kind of feedback in the future, we'll be able to see what we can be doing in this space. Okay, there's one here I'll, I'll even field for you. There's a question on National Directory of Co-working Spaces. I know that there's quite a bit of work underway, including uh, Western uh, Development Commission and National Broadband Ireland are working on that. Uh, we'll see what we can put up in the, uh, the resources through Grow Remote as well, but I know that's, uh, that's work underway. Uh, let me just scroll through here. One other one, just while I'm looking at the other ones uh, to field here for you. Um, Ruth, can you talk a little bit about the consultation process? I'm not sure how many people in our audience have already, you know, participated, you know, contributed, given input to a, uh, to a public consultation. Is this something more for, you know, HR managers or policy people, or is there an opportunity for small business owners, individual citizens, how easy is it for the typical person or an individual or even a small business to provide input to a public consultation like this? Yeah, well, we want to encourage as many people to get involved in this consultation as is possible, um, regardless of whether you're it's just a citizen, if you're a small firm, if you're a big firm, if you're a representative organization. I mean, everyone is really, really welcome to, to submit that to us. Um, the consultation would have launched last Thursday um, and we've already received a you know a really really good volume of responses from all different types of people and I'm sure that there's far more to come as well given that we'll be running it until August 7th so the best way to engage really is to to go onto our website where you can see um, the kind of questions that we're trying to answer but I mean the questions are quite broad we, we just want general feedback on what will work for employers and employees and I think now particularly as everyone has experience or the vast majority shall we say of people have um, worked from home now who hadn't been before um, and it's, it, that's actually really really in, interesting to us too because there are people um, of all different levels of experience that will have different inputs on this and, and we would welcome all of them. So definitely from small firms, big firms, any kind of organization that would like to put in um, feedback to us or advice and similarly for citizens, they're, they're most welcome to do so. Brilliant. I'm gonna combine two questions here. There's a, there's a very specific question about uh, you know guard of vetting and particularly for say adjunct teachers. Now, I know as, as whether we're talking about schooling or working, you know there are heightened concerns around data privacy, around security. I know that uh, you know bank bank employers, uh, for example, and even uh, insurance are worried about you know personal data and if it's secure. 
I assume, again, this is something that, you know, has heightened interest now that uh, we see a surge in, in remote working. Are there particular issues that, uh, that the, the department is looking at? Any, any particular commentary around heightened security, privacy, data protection issues? Well, obviously that's um, of huge interest, especially um, when anyone is working with personal data in terms of the GDPR. Um, but yeah, generally that, that is obviously something that was called out in our first report, just in terms of data protection, cybersecurity, and we have the existing guidance for that on the website as well. Um, so really what is useful for us to know now is the feedback on that. Is that clear? Um, you know, is it really, covering enough do people feel like they, they, it is supporting them and their work in terms of what they are doing um, for privacy measures and that's very much relevant to the consultation so if people have specific views on that again I, I would encourage them to, to put them in and submit them to us so then we can use them going forward to, to understand the landscape that bit better and make some more informed policy on the area. Great thank you. Uh, Two issues I want to hit on, you know, we, we often talk about all the, uh, the upsides that, you know, the positives uh, to employers, to communities, uh, you know, to employees of remote working, you know, two really good questions here, you know, one in terms of unemployed and disadvantaged, you know, are there opportunities, uh, you know, that you're seeing or you think we need to be highlighting, you know, to raise awareness and opportunity uh, for, you know, for remote working for, um, you know, for disadvantaged. Uh, and how does the, you know, how does the welfare process, is that going to, you know, have to adapt as well? I think um, I'm not too sure on the welfare process, to be honest. I mean, that will have to come out of the consultation as well. Um, in terms of the other question, I think that really it's going to, it probably will come out of, of the consultation to a certain extent, but I know that, for example, the Grow Remote training uh, with the Leash Offaly ETB, there is a focus on that in the Skills to Advance program. So that's also available for people who are currently unemployed as well as people for, who are in employment. So I think it, it's definitely, um, you know, going to be a key feature of the way we work in the future. So the Department of Education is you know quite aware of this and I think that's why they're including it on that skills to advance program through SULIS which is going to help equip people to have the skills that they need for the, the workforce ongoing so I think you I mean definitely it's important that that training is available and accessible to them yeah. uh, we've also tried to make our consultation as broad as possible um, by it you know advertising it online but we're also accepting um, postal responses and we've been in touch with a number of different um, representative organizations, whether they might be charities or for people with disabilities, just to try and understand better and encourage them to put in responses as well. Because as I said, we do want this to be something that can work for everyone. Um, and the diversity of responses will really help us to understand that and make sure that it does. Yeah, related one, uh, also very important. We're hearing more about, uh, you know, mental health and well-being issues and a question about, uh, you know, the role of the HSC getting involved in supporting uh, employers uh, as well and I assume a very similar you know similar response that it's it's the systems view of, of plugging in with these uh, departments and making sure that uh, they see their role and their contribution to this this growing phenomenon of remote working as well yeah absolutely great we're coming up I want to be very conscious of everyone's time um, question going back to the the survey that was done in in October, the 3,500, you know, how that informed, uh, you know, the, the December report. Is, is there a plan that uh, something like that will be replicated, you know, that we're looking at uh, post-COVID uh, lockdown data as well? Or what, what's the overall strategy that the department has of how you're tracking the trends and, and developments over time? Yeah, so um, that was carried out just specifically for the report. Uh, and I saw, I saw another comment there The most of the um, all of those graphs, in fact, that I've shown today are, you can see them if you look at the Remote Ireland report, if you want to see um, the, the full detail and explanation of them, it is included in that publication. Um, we don't have any plans to carry out that survey again at the moment. What we've been doing is we've been keeping an eye on all of the data that's coming out from different sources and, and of which, as I said before, it's, it's plentiful at the moment. Um, and the results are very interesting, but they're not always that different. I mean, the same issues seem to be coming up again and again. So I think we'll be focusing first on what changes that we can make to try and um, 
you know, to support people more. And with that, this guidance, that's definitely what we want to do. Um, and then we can look again to see if this has been something, you know, that, that has worked, I suppose. Um, even the CSO now are carrying out more work on uh, remote working and on businesses that are working remotely. So we will have more official data than we've ever had before. Um, but in terms of us repeating that survey that we've done in October, there's no plans for that at the moment. Okay, no problem. Uh, just checking here, one eye on the clock and one eye on the, on the Q&A. Uh, let's see. We have a question here. I think there's a real opportunity for, uh, uh, let's see, officers to help activate uh, people's potential with remote working by making them aware of the opportunities available. I'm not sure if it's a typo here. INTREO officers. I'm not sure who they are. Yeah, so they, they are, the we call them the INTREO officers, okay. officers, and they are people who help the unemployed get back into employment. Um, so definitely that, I mean, that ties in again with that training that's that's now available, but it will, yeah, I presume that that is, given that this is a huge feature of work, that that will be in the considerations of the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection. Fantastic. Uh, one final question, if I may, and then we'll just uh, wrap up here. Um, one of the other issues that's come up is that, uh, you know, a lot of the focus has been, you know, balanced, uh, balanced development, you know, people moving out of Dublin and down the country and sort of that, that rural rejuvenation. We've also been talking about, uh, you know, the, the work of the IDA and, uh, you know, foreign direct investment. Are you seeing particular issues come up policy-wise of how we look at jobs and opportunities that aren't physically tied to a specific location? And is that something that you see through the public consultation now, you know, is becoming a bigger issue that we're looking at employment you know, across the, across the country, not necessarily tied to a specific location. Yeah, so it hasn't, I mean, we haven't, you know, even touched on the amount of responses that have come in yet for the consultation because there are many and we'll probably look at them when we have them all together um, in another while because it's still open for another bit yet. Um, I mean, I think definitely the IDA is is interested in remote working, or should I say their clients are. A lot of them are obviously already in, engaged in that space. Um, and in terms of just work not being tied to one area, I, I mean, I think that that definitely is going to be the way of the future. And I, I mean, it's not even necessarily the future. We're all already doing it, you know. I mean, I'm talking to people all the time who are actually originally based in Dublin but have not been for the last couple of months because they've gone back to their, their hometowns or their home counties. Um, so it isn't something that's come up majorly yet but um, I would anticipate that it will be coming up uh, through that consultation. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been incredibly enlightening you know for me and I think for everyone else on the call. Uh, what we're going to be doing uh, everyone will let you know that uh, We'll have the links available to the uh, to the resources that uh, Ruth has shared. Uh, we'll look to have the, the presentation available as well through um, uh, through Grow Remotes, uh, social media and online uh, presence, uh, Slack community and that, et cetera. But uh, it's really important. We'd love to see you, you know, making you know, form formal contributions to the public consultation. Uh, Ruth, I'll leave you with the last word if there's any particular advice and or a question or request that you want to make uh, to our audience here as well as uh, those that will be watching uh, the recording as well. Over to you. Yeah, great. So just thank you again so much, Paul, for having me here today. It really is a great opportunity for us to be able to promote the consultation. Um, and I would just urge everyone who is interested to, to put in and make their voice heard regardless of um, who they are or who they're representing. It'll definitely be taken on board and we can help, I suppose, you know, if the more diversity of you that we have, the better it's going to be for us to help um, develop this policy ongoing. So the deadline is August 7th. You can look at it on our website and you can send us in an email through there. Um, so please uh, go ahead and send us some. here have probably seen the uh, the advertisements uh, for Three Ireland and what's been happening on Oranmore Island. But uh, we're going to be talking uh, with a few people from the from the County Council and from Oranmore. 
about the bigger impact that uh, policy and, and a very relentless focus on remote working and, and rural rejuvenation is having across Donegal as well. So Ruth, thank you for today. Thank you to our audience uh, for tuning in. Uh, you'll see the, the notes and uh, the recording up on Grow Remote's uh, YouTube uh, channel as well. Thank you so much and hope to see you all next week. Cheers.